Hello, everybody. I'm Chris Gowan, and I would like to welcome you to Science on Tap and wish you a fantastic International Women's Day. As you can see, I'm not Amanda, but I will be doing my best to fill in. And tonight we will be joined by author uh, Oliver Millman as he talks about his book, The Insect Crisis, The Fall of the Tiny Empires That Run the World. For those of you who are new to Science on Tap, we are an event series based in Portland, Oregon. Here, this was the slide is back when we did in-person events and more on in-person events later. Uh, the goal of our uh, of Science on Tap is to make science accessible, fun, uh, and meaningful, especially for adults. And without further ado, I would like to welcome tonight's speaker. Uh, an en environmental uh, correspondent at The Guardian and the author of The Insect Crisis. Please welcome Oliver Melman. Thanks so much, Chris. And um, it's great to be with you all. It's um, a real honor to be invited to speak about this, about my book, uh, which uh, came out last week in the US and Canada, uh, The Insect Crisis, The Fall of the Tiny Empires That Run the World. Um, it's a book. I feel about the the greatest and yet most uh, least appreciated crises of our time, which I feel is the loss of insects, um, even within the world of biodiversity loss that we've become so grimly familiar with recently, uh, insect loss um, is, is up there. It's probably the most important loss when we're thinking about um, uh, the the decline of creatures in our in our world for, for reasons I will outline. But first of all, I'd like to kind of take us back through the kind of mists of time back to kind of 410 million years ago, uh, the Paleozoic uh, period, a time for dinosaurs. The world looks radically different to now. Um, it's around that time we see insects as we we know them today. The first um, fossilized insect we, we recognize was found around this time. Uh, pancaked in some sandstone in, in Scotland. Um, and, and insects have a kind of slow start to, to life uh, on Earth, um, but they adapt pretty quickly to um, their surroundings and, and are the first in, in a few things. I mean, the first animals that take flight uh, in the Earth's history, were among the first to digest plants, they're among the first to camouflage themselves um, from other from other uh, uh, predators. Uh, and they're also, in some respects, enormous. Um, if we take a look at, um, uh, if we take a look at some of the, the things we see out there, um, uh, excuse me, sorry, sharing the wrong thing. <laughs> um, uh, oh dear, there, there was an enormous insect um, uh, called, um, uh, Meganora, which lived in the swamp forest of what is um, uh, what is now present-day Illinois, uh, and that was uh, absolutely huge. It had a wingspan of 28 inches, which is about the size of a mallard duck. So we had these huge and wonderful insects um, in our surroundings at, at this time, um, and uh, and the world of insects since then have have continued to kind of delight us in in many many ways. So. Um, if you spool forward through geologic time, you see that insects have survived um, five mass extinctions. They've outlived the dinosaurs. They are the great survivors. They've tenaciously hung on um, uh, beyond the dinosaurs. Uh, they've they developed this kind of intrinsic kind of intricate dance with plants. They've um, uh, de decomposed waste. They've obviously pollinated crops. They've replenished soils and trees. They've done a lot of this kind of um, background kind of unheralded work that um, uh, this this world would be so much different without. It would be a far more diminished place without them. Um, they've become intrinsic to life here. Um, uh, insects have left their imprint on their own history, uh, um, on our history. If you think about the American Revolution when the British Army were um, cornered in Yorktown, it was through a uh, uh, kind of about a malaria that the, the army became weakened and one historian called the common marsh mosquito the founding mother of the United States because it led to the, the British uh, surrender there and if you go forward another four, 100 years or so you get the invention of uh, the modern 
beehive um, in a town called Oxford in Ohio. And that's that kind of um, intricate um, way of finding out the exact right size of honeycomb for honeybees was uh, uh, this amazing breakthrough that actually allowed um, farmers to unlock the potential of their fields before then they couldn't um, they couldn't farm the kind of the full area of their their land but that one invention actually helped um, create what modern agriculture is today in terms of um, uh, the large um, industrialized monocultural farming practices that we have today and obviously are, are so problematic in, in many ways um, uh, too so um, if you go through uh, to the 1940s, um, if you were to guess what the first animal in space was, um, you might think it was a dog or a, a cat, uh, maybe it was a monkey. And in fact, it was a fruit fly, which um, was propelled beyond the atmosphere in a US military rocket uh, in an attempt to ascertain the um, potential impact of cosmic radiation on astronauts. So um, insects have been around in our history and our lives they've been so close to us they've shaped the world as we know it and, and it's always felt like they've been everywhere they've they kind of crawl in the spaces of our homes they get in the way of uh, us when we go out for picnics they they seem almost too close sometimes um, and the numbers kind of bear it out kind of three or four three out of four every known uh, animal species on earth are insects um, the number of fly species is at least four times larger than all the different types of fish found in the world's ocean. There's this one type of fly called uh, the assassin fly, which is um, a fly that spends its time uh, liquidizing the internal organs of other insects through its um, proboscis. Um, and there's more, more than 7,000 types of these kind of fly, which is more than all the uh, different kinds of mammal in the world, the, all the whales, all the um, people. <laughs> or the uh, apes, uh, dogs and cats and so on of this world. So they, they seem legion and they seem everywhere. They, some of them had some incredible abilities too. Through the writing of this book, I, I found out some astonishing things about what um, insects could do. And um, ants are incredibly uh, fascinating creatures. They obviously had very, very ordered societies um, uh, to the point that some ants act as paramedics to other ants. They actually are tasked with going out there and bringing back other injured ants um, to be tended to, um, uh, which is an amazing kind of level of organization when you think of it. There's a type of water beetle that can survive being eaten by a frog by swimming through the frog's stomach and then crawling out of his bottom, uh, which is an amazing um, escape uh, ploy if you think about it uh, in those terms. Um, paper wasps can um, can recognize other individual wasps just by looking at their faces um, and uh, honeybees uh, in themselves are amazing in terms of their abilities in terms of their logistical uh, awareness of how to go between plants how to pollinate and so on and it's found, been found they can actually add up subtract numbers um, and understand the concept of zero they can they can count up to about four or five uh, scientists have found through through various kind of interesting research um, products and honeybees can even be taught to discover landmines which they've done in croatia in a trial which was um, extremely fascinating they can actually sniff them out um, better than sniffer dogs um, if if there is the right food reward there for them uh, bumblebees can be taught to play soccer uh, they will give up sleep for the care of their hives young they can remember good and bad experiences um, these kinds of these kinds of uh, qualities hint at a form of consciousness I feel um, obviously not the kind of consciousness we would consider to be human but certainly non nonetheless a, a type of um, thinking and understanding that um, many of us would think would be beyond um, creatures so small um, abilities that far exceed the the, the, the size of the creature we're talking about here. Um, and so it seemed, it see, can seem kind of incomprehensible, really, um, almost impossible that uh, insects could be any kind of existential danger, when, given this history, given the fact that they are the great survivors, they're so tenacious, they have gone through some really dark times on this planet. Um, and also the fact that 
like I was mentioning before, their day-to-day -day, day -day interactions with them seem so numerous and so annoying. Um, they are probably the closest animal to us day-to-day, -day, um, if you think about it, other than perhaps cats or dogs, perhaps other than our pets. They, we interact with insects the most, and a lot of those interactions we would consider to be unpleasant, if you think about a bite or a sting or uh, that annoying fly hovering near your food or an ant marching into your pantry and you know getting into the jam um, they seem everywhere um, all the time I mean even ironically during the um, writing of this book I uh, my kitchen was invaded by an army of ants they kept marching right into my apartment here in New York and um, I could not stop them whatever I tried to do to block their path into my kitchen uh, nothing seemed to work um, and in the end I kind of almost had to give up in admiration of their persistence and um, ability to, um, to to get where they wanted to go which was into my cupboards and under my sink um, and despite this um, uh, implausibility of insects being in trouble um, as my book outlines insects are in fact suffering a sort of silent catastrophe uh, it kind of a decline well out of public view in most um, respects. There are no kind of glitzy ads on TV like there are polar bears on, on pieces of floating ice. There are no um, sad looking insects like there are orangutans in a burnt out forest in Indonesia. Um, the, this, is a, this is a kind of background disaster, a, a, a sort of um, unknowable and unknown kind of apocalypse in in the in the insect world they're kind of disappearing at our environments at a frightening rate in in places uh, in many places where they've been documented to do so um i and uh, scientists are only really kind of catching on to this just in the last few years because previously it seemed um ridiculous and pointless to actually count insects um to actually um go through any kind of data and ascertain what the trends were with numbers. I mean, if you look back at the history of our interaction with insects, you had people like Winston Churchill, for example, he kept butterflies to ease his depression. Um, Nabokov, the, the author, he, he kept butterfly genitalia. You can find those at Harvard University if you really want to look at them. Um, uh, uh, Rothschild, um, the, the, the head of the banking family, uh, Walsh Rothschild, he, he used to keep fleas and um, dress them up in costumes. There's a museum in England, if you really wanted to go to, where you could see ants dressed up as um, Mexican characters. Uh, there's even a couple that are dressed as a bride and a groom. So we've always been kind of interested in insects in a kind of, um, kind of quirky way, interested in their habits and their forms and their colours, uh, certainly their abilities as well. Um, but we had never really thought to count them. It seemed pointless, laborious, and where would be the funding for such a thing? But starting from about 2017, 2018, uh, a series of studies started coming out from some of the people that started to actually look at this. And uh, some of the few people that had actually been taking data for a long period of time came out with it. And I, I kind of put, put in my book that they're like the people who um, uh, were the only ones to um, keep scoring in a football game that suddenly became <laughs> very important to the rest of us. Um, uh, the kind of big landmark study was from 2017. It was taken in Germany. This, this group of entomologists and scientists uh, based in the city of Krefeld um, had been uh, trapping and documenting insects for years, going back decades. Um, the data was in this kind of old school building uh, in dusty rooms, there was uh, some floppy disks and typewrite, typewrite into, um, typed notes, uh, CD-ROMs, uh, all in the kind of jumble. Um, but when the scientists were speaking about what was happening, anecdotally, they were talking about uh, the fact that they weren't seeing as much as they used to. And a group of scientists from various countries got together and crunched the numbers. They started looking at um, uh, data from traps in 63 different protected nature areas across Germany. So these aren't industrial areas. These aren't kind of the middle of soy fields or anything like that, not in the middle of cities, natural protected areas in Germany. Um, 
and they took data from these traps called malaise traps, which are kind of like hovering tents where uh, insects will go through and they end up getting stuck in some alcohol um, being trapped there. And then you can go and count them or most commonly you weigh them. And this is what was done in this study was looking at the actual uh, average weights of these insects over a period of time. And they had the data um, consistently going back to 1989. So they had a decent range of time. And they, what they found was quite astonishing, really. It was 76% uh, decline in the average uh, weight of flying insects in that time since from 1989. And in the height of summer, when you expect insects to actually be at their peak, uh, the decline was even sharper. It was 82% uh, decline in insects. So um, a really quite astonishing type of loss. Uh, there were other studies that then kind of came out. They seem to be this kind of avalanche of them. They seem to kind of gather pace and um, it seemed to kind of overwhelm the media. Suddenly we started hearing about insectageddon as being a term, or, um, uh, the insect catastrophe. Uh, there was this other study which particularly struck me from this entomologist um, called Brad Lister, who is based in upstate New York, and kind of as a younger man in the 1970s, he went to the El Yunque rainforest, which is the only rainforest on US territory. It's in Puerto Rico. And he went there and he surveyed the insects through sticky plates. So essentially it's kind of plastic plates with um, st sticky substances put on them. And he put them in the canopy and he put them in there, uh, the forest floor. Uh, and he, when he would go back in the morning to check on these plates in the 70s, they were just thick with insects. They were just covered with them. They were blackened. Um, and he went back a couple of years ago uh, with, a, with a colleague and um, they repeated the experiment. They put it there, the plates up in the canopy, they put them down on the forest floor. And even before they got the results back, they, they were a little perturbed by what they were finding around themselves. They, they couldn't really see any lizards around, the insect eating lizards that were in the environment. They didn't see many butterflies fluttering uh, around. Um, they didn't see uh, or hear many birds in the trees. And, and again, this is a, uh, a place you would expect to be fairly well protected. It's been kind of untouched really since um, the Spanish arrival in Puerto Rico. Um, there's no great agriculture around there or uh, urban areas. Um, and yet the declines were astronomical. When you look at, um, when you compared the data from the 1970s to uh, to what it was um, just kind of four years ago. 98% of insects on the ground by biomass had gone. Uh, up in the canopy, 80% had disappeared. And he said he was astonished. He couldn't, he couldn't quite believe it, that there'd be such a, a large drop. Um, and it, the cast you eye around elsewhere, and um, it, it seems that these declines aren't unique. I mean, uh, there's a there was a study in the forest in New Hampshire and beetles there, their abundance were down 83% uh, since the 1970s. Uh, one in four bumblebees in North America are in decline. Um, butterflies have declined by 84% in the Netherlands since 19, uh, sorry, 1890. Um, uh, butterfly numbers in Britain have halved in the last 50 years. So these are, these are quite um, severe uh, and, and deep uh, declines and not the kind of ones you normally see in conservation biology. I mean, I think they they stand out as being particularly alarming. I mean, you see huge reductions in certain species, but over a longer period of time, you may have, we may have lost maybe kind of 95, 90% of all tigers, for example, from what we historically knew uh, they were. Um, back before uh, obviously colonization and uh, mass hunting of them. Um, but that was over a, over, a, over a longer period of time. We're talking, you know, 100, 150 years or so of, of hunting these creatures, habitat loss and so on. Uh, whereas here we're finding almost a complete wipeout of insects in just a few decades, which is um, uh, incredible really when you, when you think about it. And that was, that's what really kind of captured my attention and, Struck, struck me and, and, and kind of compelled me to write this book because I think as an environment writer, I, like many other environment writers, have been drawn to the charismatic 
big creatures of our world, the ones that really grab our attention, the rhinos and the lions and, and the bears and so on. Um, uh, much of our work, of course, is, um, is revolves around climate change and its impacts there too. So in between all of these various different crises going on, this kind of insect crisis has seemed rather hidden. Um, I never really thought that I would be writing about this. Uh, um, and yet here I am writing about it. So um, when, you, when you look through the research, the list of horrors really kind of go on and on. Um, and, and the picture is not complete by any means. We can't say for certain that insects are in decline in every single country uh, around the world because we don't have the data on all, all the insects that even exist. I mean, there's one million named species of insects in the world, but there may be 5 million, up to 30 million by some estimates, insects, because we just haven't catalogued this vast trove of life yet. Um, so we don't know yet exactly what the scale of the insect crisis is in many parts of the world. Um, and some scientists have uh, cautioned that uh, it's maybe too premature to kind of talk about this as being uh, the kind of outright disaster that it appears to be. Um, but most entomologists you speak to will be confident enough in saying there is there are widespread declines uh, that threaten these profound consequences for us all, and that we should act on imperfect information or incomplete information. Um, sometimes uh, climate change is a very good parallel for this if we'd if we'd um, acted as we as we maybe should have 30, 40 years ago, perhaps we wouldn't be in the situation we are now. And we're now in this kind of early stages of knowing exactly what's happening in the insect world. And it's similarly not very pretty. Uh, the United Nations estimates that half a million insect species could become extinct by the midpoint of the century, which again is an incredible number if you think about it from a species um, population point of view, because um, you know, that that pay, you know, that dwarfs any other kind of type of animal really in terms of what's what's at risk and what's at stake i mean may, some of you may think or maybe not because you are plugged into science and you you want to appreciate their their use but some may feel well why does this matter i mean insects um, like i was saying before irritate a great deal of us um, i'm sure a lot of us would want to get rid of all cockroaches and all mosquitoes in the world Many of us would think that flies are pointless. I mean, what's the point of that? Uh, uh, those flies, but um, I think I think it only takes a little bit of thinking about how the world operates and how the world works and what we rely upon to to realize to realize they're important. Um, I mean, insects pollinate about a third of the food we eat. They do a lot of the glamorous work, breaking down feces and dead bodies. Um, one researcher told me that without insects, we'd be living the world full of poop with uh, dead Uncle Jeremy floating on past us. So quite a grim kind of thought there. Um, they're essential in cycling nutrients through uh, plants and soils, keeping the kind of cycle of life um, spinning. And um, they're also food, of course. Um, for, for generations, they've been food for cultures across um, Asia, Africa, uh, South America. They've been used as medicines uh, in those cultures too. But of course, we most, we mostly know them as being food for other creatures. So you pull insects away from uh, that kind of base of, of the food web and the whole system starts to kind of cave in on itself. And indeed, we're already seeing the signs of that. And there's a growing list of countries, birds that uh, dine mostly on insects. We're thinking about the kind of warblers, the swallows, the bluebirds. Uh, they're suffering, suffering deeper population drops on omnivorous birds such as um, crows starlings. Um, there was an analysis of bird trends in Europe that found that insect eating birds declined by 13% between 1990 and uh, 2015, while the omnivorous birds, such as the crows, they remained stable. So there's been this clear kind of disconnect. Um, just over in a 10 year period, uh, up until recently, there was an estimated 12 million pairs of breeding birds just disappeared from Germany. They've just been wiped out. Um, it's about 15% of the, the world population there. And in 2018, it was uh, reported the bird populations across the French countryside had uh, fallen by more than a third since, um, uh, since the turn of the millennium. So we've seen these clear kind of fingerprints of insect decline, even when we don't see the 
data that re relates directly to it in a certain place, you can see the consequences that are starting to kind of un unfold now. Um, uh, we think we think mainly when we think of insects and their use about our bellies, um, because bees have become the kind of avatar for all insects, um, and of course. They are hugely important to our food supply. Bees um, pollinate apples and cranberries and melons and almonds, broccoli, blueberries, uh, cherries. I mean, the list goes on and on. All the kind of colourful and interesting things on our plate really are um, uh, come from from uh, bees and, and other insects pollinating them. Um, the world supply of chocolate is dependent on a tiny midge that crawls into the cacao plant and uh, pollinates it. And the production of uh, ice cream is uh, dependent on insects that pollinate alfalfa, which uh, in turn cows eat, that then produce the, the dairy for ice cream. So, I mean, if you like, for when uh, people do ask, uh, why, why should we care? Why bother about insects? Um, if you like birds, if you like chocolate, if you like ice cream, if you like food, fruit and vegetables, uh, if you like not dying in a, a horrible malnourished uh, death surrounded by crap and uh, dead bodies, then then you should like insects because they're preventing all of those things from happening. And the biologist Theo Wilson, who passed away this year, he he kind of estimated we would last maybe three or four months without uh, insects in a world without them. Um, we, it would be a very kind of grim place to to live in a world without insects. And although we're not heading to that i mean by all estimates we will probably not outlive insects they will um, continue in some form uh, uh, beyond us um, we are creating a, a kind of hellscape for them and we're changing the composition of them i mean if you're thinking about the things that we value in this world the the bees and the butterflies we're doing away with them and making the world much more amenable to cockroaches as well as you know, rats and raccoons and other things that can survive in the human dominated world. So we're already seeing some impacts from uh, loss of insects. Uh, the production of certain fruits and vegetables is being diminished by lack of pollination. If you go to China, some places in China, uh, teams of people kind of are sent to kind of fan out into orchards with brushes and sticks to pollinate fruit because of the lack of bees. Um, uh, it's estimated the world could face an extra 1 million de deaths a year because of uh, conditions such as heart disease caused by a lack of nutrition because of the lack of uh, pollination. There are teams around the world working on robot bees as a kind of far-fetched um, way of, uh, of um, uh, replacing bees. Um, so we're already seeing those kind of impacts, we're already seeing um, uh, some of the kind of consequences of the insect crisis play out. Um, uh, I should mention also the insects as well as this kind of health impact without them. Ironically, they are also a great source of medicine. Some um, researchers have found that bee venom can help uh, combat um, certain cancers and even dandruff. And honey is um, uh, very good at combating uh, heart disease and skin problems. And there's an innovation where this mouthwash is made of propolis, which is the, made by bees to seal their hives, is um, uh, apparently a very promising remedy for high blood pressure and um, gum disease. So we're losing a great deal when we we lose insects. They do incredible things for us and all other uh, living things on Earth. Um, they pretty much prop up the whole edifice of life on this planet, and they they do so in this kind of quiet background um, way, uh, largely unheralded. In fact rather derided. We've rewarded, rewarded them for this hard work by wiping out large numbers of them, uh, making the rest of them quite miserable, deranged, uh, sent deranged by the chemicals we spray, uh, and even disparaged, and we call them creepy crawlies. Uh, we say that annoying people bug us. We're really quite rude about insects. Um, we're really quite rude about them, kind of, and in, in a way that's kind of culturally taught. It's, we're culturally uh, averse to them. So why, why is this happening? Why are we losing insects? I, mean, I think that's a kind of key question and obviously one that we have to address if we are going to um, tackle the insect crisis. The three main things that um, scientists blame for the decline of insects, um, there are lots of other uh, factors and a lot of them over, kind of overlap and interplay with each other. 
but the big three are um, habitat loss. So we've cut down a third of all trees on this planet. Um, at the start of the industrial era, we've transformed uh, what were previously forests and grasslands and wild meadows into featureless monocultural farmland, cities, high, highways, industrial areas. This has been disastrous for uh, many animals, but um, particularly insects. Um, the second big thing is pesticide use. So not only have we taken away a diverse range of food and shelter from insects, uh, we've decided to literally poison them. The insecticides we use liberally across uh, croplands kill pests uh, like aphids for example but they wipe out pretty much everything else the bees the beetles the uh, butterflies uh, by one estimate uh, america's agricultural land is 48 times more toxic than it was 25 years ago this this poison has been kind of layered and layered and layered and layered it hasn't just um it remained at a steady rate doing its kind of job of of getting rid of pests and helping uh, crops and indeed there's plenty of evidence that frustratingly um, crop yields aren't even helped by the amount of insecticide being heaped upon them. So we're sending insects deranged, uh, killing many of them, uh, scrambling the brains of, of many of them um, for, for not much, for not much benefit. Um, certainly when you think about the environmental costs of, of doing away with so many important insects. The third big thing is climate change. So Previously, uh, scientists thought maybe insects would fare a bit better than other species during the climate crisis, um, and that has turned out not to be the case. Um, insects survive in a fairly narrow band of temperature, and um, unless you're a dragonfly or something like that, you can't really travel that far if you're an insect. So you're kind of stuck in this kind of uh, same kind of environments that you were always in, uh, and uh, the temperature has been cranked up. We've thrown off the, uh, we've thrown the seasons off kilter too. So uh, insects, much like plants and birds, have this kind of interplay. The the seasons kind of uh, hugely dictate. So spring is now arriving twenty days earlier than it once was in parts of the US. So the whole kind of um, cascade of events that happens in the onset of spring has been thrown completely off by climate change, and insects are suffering from that. Uh, it's been disastrous for them and um, uh, it'll only get worse, of course. Um, I, I think a kind of key reason for these declines, though, beyond those things, uh, and there are other things as well, such as light pollution. So um, we've lit up the night skies and it's been disastrous for fireflies, for example, but also other insects to rely upon um, the dark to, to, to signal time for mating or food gathering and so on. But I think the cultural aspect is the one that kind of links all these things together we can we associate insects with disease and death and irritation and some of that is justified when you consider the kind of huge toll that comes from disease carrying mosquitoes and so on but um it runs deeper than that you speak to the entomologists who do outreach to schools and they say the kindergartners love insects they find them fascinating and, and really um uh, really intriguing and they love kind of handling them and finding out cool facts about them and so on but the time they're in high school they they hate them um we, we kind of teach children culturally, we, we kind of um, imbibe in them that um, the insects are these terrible things. Um, and you, you see that as well culturally in terms of the way we live, the way we set up our lives and what's considered an ideal life is kind of the polar opposite to an insect's well being. We kind of value tidiness and order and everything is right place. And we call plants that are in just we consider to be in the wrong place to be weeds and um, the only thing that makes them a weed is that we think they're in the wrong place and they don't look great but to, to insects they're valuable food and shelter um, we fetishize the growing and keeping of these vast manicured lawns um, which have become a sort of symbol of the suburban american dream and that dream is going to be exported to other countries of course as well uh, one of the most startling facts i found out uh, about actually in the writing of this book is that lawns are the largest irrigated crop in America. It's actually three times the area uh, of corn uh, in, in this country is actually set aside just for lawns, um, which is just, again, another monocultural crop, um, usually kind of closely cut, no variety there. We have these large kind of featureless lawns, large featureless fields next to them of just single crops like soy or corn. Um, they, these areas have no life for them. Uh, in, in them for insects, they're kind of like a desert. And one expert told me it's like, um, all you have to eat are chips, nothing but chips. Even if you don't like chips or allergic to chips, 
that's all we're giving them. Um, it's, it's not a very kind of rich diet for them. We kind of stamped out the scruffy disorder, that kind of wild tangle of different plants, the kind of riot of different vegetation that insects love and actually um, provide us a kind of vibrant world around us, um, an interesting world around us. And we've just um, stamped that all out, made it made it all kind of very samey, really. Um, I mean, when you go to a place that hasn't been kind of manicured to death like this, um, you can actually notice the difference instantly. It's startling. I've kind of walked through um, wildflower meadows um, that have been kind of untouched, really, and it's incredible. You have the plant, the, they grow up to your kind of knee, and you have the insects kind of hitting your legs and your face, and you can hear them, and you can see them, and the place is kind of thrumming with life. It's uh, it's it's kind of um, vibrant and alive, and it's it's kind of exciting, really. It's kind of the complete opposite of this kind of deadened world we've created around ourselves. We've pushed insects and other creatures away as far as we can from ourselves. Um, uh, I think that's uh, ultimately the key to solving this insect crisis. We, I mean, we need big policy changes on kind of pesticide use, uh, farming practices, but there's a lot we can do ourselves, or, or rather there's a lot we can not do. I mean, one entomologist said we need, need more of an inaction plan than an action plan. We, we just need to let things go a bit, let things slide. Um, uh, we saw during the pandemic that local authorities didn't uh, cut the grass by highways, and you started seeing these wildflowers kind of pop up. Um, and, and once they kind of, they're allowed to kind of bounce back in some way, you then start getting the insects back. And then once you start getting the insects back, you start seeing the birds come back. And so you get these kind of oases of life in these kind of unlikely seeming places um, by highways, by railway lines or abandoned houses or uh, other kind of seemingly derelict areas. Suddenly there's, there's life. Um, and I think that's given us a little glimpse of what, what things could be. Um, we could do that all over Kind of urban areas, the edges of fields, uh, without any loss to us, without any impact, uh, negative impact to our lives. In fact, it would be highly beneficial. Um, at home, if you have a yard, maybe mow it a bit less, uh, mow the lawn a bit less, maybe don't rake the leaves so often, because um, insects like to hide under there. Germany has actually banned gas-powered leaf blowers for that, for that exact reason. Um, don't put chemicals all over your property. Um, just a little laziness can go a long way here. You don't, we don't need to kind of invent a new vaccine here or win a space race or come up with some crazy new technology. We can just let things go a little bit, uh, uh, let our kind of fussiness go a little bit and, and the insects can, can bounce back. Um, one uh, entomologist said to me, it's a bit like they're a log in water and we're just pressing our foot down on them. Uh, if we just ease our foot off a little bit, they will kind of bounce bob back up again. Um, and that's what we can give, we, we can do, we can give them the chance to kind of um, uh, breathe and survive and um, back, uh, roar back into our lives again and, and make them so much more vibrant by doing so. I mean, insects deserve their, I'd say the insects deserve their place in the world beyond our own needs, of course. I mean, it's not just about what they do for us. I mean, I was lucky enough to go to um, central Mexico um, just before the pandemic hit to see the arrival of monarch butterfly migration down from the US and Canada, which is, I would say, one of nature's great spectacles, really. Um, I, I went to the mountains there and I took a horse actually up to up to where the, the trees kind of uh, form in kind of valleys and groves there. And you see the trees um, just covered in these kind of orange and black butterflies that you know, each butterfly weighs about the same as a raisin, and yet they can travel kind of 3,000 uh, miles. Um, incredible, incredible um, migration. And there were so many of these butterflies on these trees, millions of them, that the, the, um, the boughs of the trees were kind of sagging. And sometimes the branches snap because there are just so many of these uh, butterflies on them, which is incredible. And when they kind of rouse themselves to, to fly away, it was amazing it was like a dream it was a kind of transcendent moment of, of beauty in our world and um the, the crying shame of that of course is that it's like much of the beauty in the insect world is threatened and and maybe on the way out there's an estimate that that migration may be over 
in just a few decades because of climate change, that the trees there could not survive in the temperatures that are now um, estimated to be on their way. So um, uh, the monarchs will have nowhere to, to rest and roost and, uh, and breed and head back to, to the US. So the migration diminished from what it was and it might, um, it'll end within a few decades, um, which is horrible. We are losing a huge amount of beauty from our world. Um, and I'd say kind of finally, um, in summation, that um, we should save that beauty and that utility um, for insects for their sake. But ultimately, we should um, save it for ourselves to save ourselves. Thank you very much. And we can um, go to questions, I think. Thank you so much, Oliver Millman, for your talk about um, like just the different insects as well as how we're impacting insects and the repercussions of all of that. I do have a few questions. And if I start to look away from my monitor at you, it's because I'm like got a few devices here uh, looking at different questions as they come in. So the first one, and there's been some conversation about this in the chat a little bit, but what is the one small change you think that us as individuals could do to help with um, the bug populations? Um, I mean, I think it depends on your own circumstance, but I mean, if you have a lawn, for example, if you, had a, if you have a yard, um, I think there's a great deal you can do there. Um, I think you can just not, be so fussy with it. You can just let a little wildness in, back in. You can uh, not mow the lawn as much. You can plant a, a range of native plants um, and, and not go for the kind of ornamental showy things that aren't uh, favorable to native pollinators. Um, you can cut down the use of chemicals in your home and your property. So if you, if you, um, if you are, uh, you know, a homeowner who has a, has a backyard, then that's, that's one really good step. Um, if you don't, I mean, there's lots of other things you can do um, to, to help. Um, I mean, obviously, there are kind of big changes and small changes. So kind of voting, obviously, is the change that helps enact big change. Um, but there are ways to kind of um, help uh, in insect populations um, by, you know, the practices you have in terms of the food you buy, um, uh, the chemicals you use and so on. So um, there, are, there are some little things to do. But I think just mainly giving them a, a little bit of breathing room, a little space to survive. And that's all they'll need to kind of bounce back a little bit. You don't need to do that much. So related, a couple of people have asked if uh, buying organic specifically is helpful for insects as well as our own health. Uh, yes, it is in the, you know, um, uh, obviously there, there aren't the chemicals associated with the death of insects all over the place there. I think there will be a kind of bigger kind of crunch point though, unfortunately, when it comes to feeding the world's population, we're on course for kind of 10 billion people by the midpoint of this century. And um, the choices of how to feed that many people are, are pretty um, unappealing. You either cut down more rainforest to, produce, to, to get more farmland to produce more food, which is obviously terrible for many animals, including insects, or you more uh, intensively farm the areas you already have. So more chemicals, more, more kind of um, machinery, more, more kind of ordered kind of uh, control. Um, so that is a kind of conundrum we haven't quite got our heads around yet in terms of um, how to solve that, but certainly individually, if you could eat organic, then that's that can help. Uh, ironically, it would help if you actually ate, ate insects, um, uh, which uh, seems counterintuitive. But if you think about the environmental impact of meat eating, particularly eating beef, the impact on air pollution, water pollution, climate change, and the vast amount of land that it, uh, that, that consumes, usually from deforested land, um, it actually causes all kinds of impacts that insects suffer from. Uh, and eating insects, such as crickets, for example, crickets have become very popular in terms of um, being kind of ground up into energy bars or sprinkled on food or eaten with chili or so on. Um, that would actually be uh, beneficial to insects um, in a kind of surprising way, I think, for a lot of people, because it would actually free up a lot of the, 
uh, the land, the space, the environment would actually, the, the impact on the environment would be lessened if we did that. Do you think it's pop? Do you think it's possible for us to be able to consume enough insects or change our dietary habits such that we would be eating enough insects to really help with offset the meat consumption? Yeah, I mean, you can raise like, trillions of crickets in a in a kind of shipping container, you know, um, and they are a great source of protein and zinc and other vitamins, um, you know cultures uh, outside the west have been eating these insects for you know hundreds of years um obviously it's a bit yucky to many of us uh, in the west um but attitudes change don't they i mean if you think about lobsters i think a great example lobsters were once kind of thought of these these terrible kind of disgusting bottom feeders and they used to be kind of dredged up and ground up and used as fertilizer on fields and now what do you have a 30 buck lobster roll um, sushi used to be thought of as kind of this weird kind of Japanese thing and now it's you know one of the most popular foods in the world I and mean, we can change we can change our kind of perceptions of food quite quickly I think and and then I think certainly um, uh, when it comes to eating insects we can do that and we perhaps should as well. Uh, one person asks uh, can we at least get rid of mosquitoes would that be okay? <laughs> uh, I mean I'm sure a lot of us would love to, wouldn't they? I did speak to one researcher as part of the book and she was trying to find ways to kill mosquitoes, wipe them out for about 20 years. That was her kind of career until one day she was kind of looking through the microscope of the mosquito and she thought it looked beautiful. It's kind of big kind of compound eyes and it's beautiful wings and so on. Um, and she had this kind of what she said was an epiphany where she thought, goodness, should we really be killing them all off. I mean, not just because of how they look, um, which I don't think any of us can really appreciate, but um, what they do, I mean, if you got rid of them, they'd have all these, these unintended consequences. Um, they're part of the food chain. You know, if you're a frog or a bird, you would dine on mosquitoes in a lot of instances. Um, they are part of the web of life um, and getting rid of them could have kind of unforeseen circumstances we wouldn't quite appreciate but um at the same time you know malaria and dengue and yellow fever and all those other things i can understand why people would want to get rid of them for sure uh you talk about um the charismatic megafauna and how it's a lot more like easily appealing for to see an orangutan or polar bear or, or something like that to pull at heartstrings do you have your own personal charismatic charismatic mini fauna <laughs> uh i Oh God, I do. Yeah, there's so many just great, great um, insects um, that I learned about. One of my favorites was the Hercules moth, which is the, the world's largest moth. And it lives in, the, in northern Australia and it's the size of a dinner plate. And um, it doesn't have a mouth because it doesn't eat. It, eat, it has its, lives off the food it ate as a caterpillar. And it has two false eyes on its bottom to um, confuse predators. And these, this the insect that is kind of paraded around schools in Australia and astonishes people. Oh, this is also a part of the world, I would say, that some people there um, keep uh, a giant burrowing cockroach, the largest cockroach in the world, as a pet. So I think that maybe says a lot about Australia. <laughs> um, are there, organ we talk about like the politics behind some of this, you were mentioning that, but are there any organizations or bills that you're aware of that support this issue of the insect crisis? Organizations that work to do something about it, you mean? Yeah, raise awareness of the insect crisis or if there's even any bills or anything related to protecting insects. Yeah, sure. I mean, under Obama, there were actually quite a few kind of pro-pollinator policies that he tried to push forward. He tried to um, ban the use of pesticides within uh, national parks, kind of public land. Uh, Trump undid a lot of that, um, unfortunately. Um, I think that is stalled at the moment. I mean, it's not like the world at the moment is um, short of crises to tackle. <laughs> um, and I think insects were never really going to be top of the list in, in, in um, problems to solve, and they've certainly been pushed down a little bit now, even in the last few weeks, probably. Um, 
but there are lots of organizations doing good work. The Center for Biological Diversity is a good one. The Xerces Society, which is named after a butterfly that went extinct in California. Um, uh, that's a kind of insect focused um, uh, conservation group. Um, there are um, lots of environmental groups who kind of see that uh, importance and see the connection. Um, if you lose bees, then we're in big trouble. And I think people can kind of grasp onto that idea. We're seeing a kind of understanding, I think, um, uh, of, of, of the importance of bees. So the kind of Save the Bees campaign you see all around the world now, because um, people can kind of uh, understand the importance there. Yeah, and similar to sort of actions we can take, uh, someone was asking about uh, landscaping practices. Are there certain, dare I say, buzzwords or things to look for in terms of landscaping um, companies uh, that would be better practice and better for insects? Ooh, good question. I'm not sure. Um, probably. I mean, best luck on an ad hoc basis, I would say. Talk to them. I mean, I did I did actually talk to some people who were involved in the, um, uh, the banning of um, gas blows, gas pad um, leaf blowers in Washington, D.C., and there is, I did speak to a landscaping company there who'd gone to electric leaf blowers and then were thinking of ditching them entirely because they were concerned about the impact on, on insects. They were kind of trying to kind of tread very carefully around um, uh, that kind of whole issue and, and how, to, how to do their work in a sustainable way. So um, I'm sure they are out there. Just talk to them, I guess. Yeah. Uh, this one's a little bit more Heady, I don't know, I, I will read it verbatim here. Do you see a potential for the coexistence between urbanization and the rejuvenation of insect life? And if so, what, what would that even look like? Sorry, the urbanization, so the what, sorry, yeah. urban areas. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yes. I mean, the, the weird thing is in many parts of the world, the most, the greatest variety of bugs you will find is in urban areas because you have the weeds you have a variety of plants you have you know all kinds of different things going on in this kind of urban environment where if you just shifted to rural areas parts of part, many parts of the us canada europe in particular um you just have this monocultural kind of landscape this kind of moonscape of, of just soy and nothing else there's no there's no other kind of plants even the fringes is all very kind of uh, uniform and tidy um, so in many respects um, urban areas are a kind of refuge for some uh, insects and there certainly is kind of some really good work going on around um, encouraging that I went to a, a green roof uh, project in New York City where uh, it was in the Greenpoint area of Brooklyn which is the kind of former kind of industrial heartland I guess of, of what New York City used to be um, and there were um, uh, there was this roof of this former um, oil um, uh, oil company uh, building where a uh, uh, kind of wildflower meadow had been put down and it was this kind of verdant kind of green kind of uh, shockingly green kind of um, area in the kind of midst of this industrial kind of zone and it was alive with insects I mean it was incredible to see the amount of life there and what you think would be quite a dead area for them um, so certainly people can um, do lots of things in urban areas. There's also this big trend, there's quite hipster trend for urban beekeeping. Um, so you see that all around the world in cities where people want to keep bees and they, they kind of feel that's that's helping. I would say that's a double-edged sword because most of the time, of course, they're keeping honeybees, which um, uh, the managed bees of our world, they are um, in many respects a kind of agricultural input, like a pig or a cow or a, or a tractor. Um, and they're voracious in terms of their um, ability to kind of go out there and suck up all the kind of nectar and pollen out there which can kind of elbow out the wild bees and the bumblebees and so on all the other thousands of species out there that aren't kept in high uh, hives uh, and tended to by us so um, that can be uh, detrimental to kind of this kind of focus just on honeybees so um, we should maybe think carefully about that but but generally speaking yeah um, cities don't mean death for insects for sure right and with all this, uh, like you've talked about sporadic uh, studies about insect counting and things like that. Is there any efforts to create like a worldwide insect counter or a database where like the sort of counting is centralized? 
No, there, no, there isn't. I mean, there have been some meta studies done, so, so these kind of compendiums of different studies. Uh, there was one that came out in 2018 that found that 40% of insect species are declining. But that, again, that's based on incomplete uh, picture of the world. But um, I think certainly now, given the kind of publicity and attention that the, the decline in insects has got just in the last few years, uh, I think there are uh, lots of scientists combing through their data going out there to do these these kind of trapping exercises to, to collate it. So I wouldn't be surprised in a few years we have a far uh, more systemized and, and, and better understanding of what's happening out there. But in terms of a kind of global database, I think we're I think we're a little way off that. I mean, we're not even, we don't even know what's out there. I mean, we don't we don't know all the insects out there. So it's hard to kind of say how many of them are declining. And we like to end all our uh, Q and A's with the same question of all our presenters. And I like to pose it to you, which is why do you feel it's important for us to continue to learn about science? Well, I mean, for many reasons, I mean, science is um, fascinating. It's fun. It's often hilarious. Uh, I mean, the things I found out in this book often just made me chuckle. Um, uh, but I think it's just incredibly important in our current era where we see the kind of threats to uh, democracy, the environment, um, uh, just basic understanding of knowledge. Knowledge, I think, is that we, which is what science is, really, um, is, is more important than ever, I think, really, um, to tackle all, all the kind of major problems we face. Um, and then without it, we, we will be lost. So we will be quite, quite literally lost. So um, I think science is um, great. I encourage everyone to um, read all the wonderful scientific books that are out there because it's moved from this kind of quite dry area of literature to this kind of very rich and kind of vibrant area to think about climate fiction, cli-fi uh, and all kinds of other books by um, uh, authors in recent years. I think it's um, really brought the whole topic alive and I think it's come at a really important time because we, I think we need science more, more now than ever before. Well, thank you so much for your presentation and your thoughtful answers and uh, good luck with your, your book tour, the rest of your book tour. And thank you so much for coming to speak with us today. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you so much. And Thanks everybody. Once again, just as a reminder, and we'll put this link in the chat that you can uh, get The Insect Crisis uh, from Broadway Books at a 15% discount through the end of the month. And there's the code and we will uh, put that in the chat because it's kind of a big long code, but uh, yes. So buy your book there. And I promised you that I would tease you about in-person events coming back. And here is our first in-person event. It will be at the Alberta Rose Theater in Portland. It will also be online as a hybrid event. We are gonna be practicing and experimenting with doing uh, hybrid events. Uh, it will be with Franz DeWall who spoke uh, about his book, Mama's Last Hug in 2019. Uh, this is on his new book, Different, Gender Through the Eyes of a Primatologist. So tickets will be going on sale for that relatively soon. I think in the next couple of days, but yes, Friday, April 8th at 7 p.m. at the Alberta Rose in Portland. And we look forward to being back in person soon. And with, uh, without the support of our Patreon supporters, these are our members that donate $10 or more a month. We would not be able to put uh, these events on in the first place. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And if you would like to become a Patreon supporter, we will be putting that link in the chat as well. So we really appreciate everyone's support that's helped us through this pandemic and now beyond. And also, uh, if you would like to make a one-time donation uh, instead of becoming a Patreon supporter, that is also our link. You can make a one-time donation to makeyouthink.org slash support, or again, uh, ongoing donation at our Patreon site, which is also Make You Think, which is our uh, over uh, our overlord, <laughs> which is our overarching organization that brings on science on tap events. So thank you everybody uh, for joining us today and have an excellent evening. And again, happy International Women's Day. <laughs>